and at other times to the south, and so on. This is an extraordinary observation, and it was a great surprise to scientists when it was first discovered. It was discovered in a variety of different ways. For example, in Australia, the stones which Aborigines had laid around their campfire about 30,000 years ago and had heated above the Curie point were taken back to the laboratory, now of course cool, and there it was found that the magnetic field, the direction of the magnetic field, that those once hot stones had preserved in them was opposite. The direction was opposite to the direction of the present Earth's magnetic field. In other words, the North Pole in those rocks was where the South Pole is now, and the South Pole is where the North Pole is now. In other words, the direction of the Earth's magnetic field in those rocks heated above the Curie point 30,000 years ago was exactly opposite to what it is today. The Earth's magnetic field was, in fact, reversed. And that observation has been confirmed in, for example, the lavas of volcanoes. This is a cross-section of a volcano, a volcano sliced down the middle, if you like. And you can see it formed of a succession of hundreds of lava flows erupted over the last million years or so. And as you might expect, the lava reaching the surface and pouring out on the flanks of the volcano at the present day has preserved within it the current direction, the present direction of the Earth's magnetic field, north to the north, if you like. And we've represented this by the red layer on this enlargement of the pile of lava. If we were to dig down into the volcano and find lavas about 30,000 years old, we find that the lava preserves the opposite direction of that at present, thus confirming the observation made on the stones that the Aborigines heated above the Curie point about 30,000 years ago and which subsequently cooled to preserve the magnetic field at that time. The North Pole points to the south. Between about 30,000 and 800,000 years ago, the lavas, colored orange in this pile, preserve the present direction of the Earth's magnetic field. Evidently, at that time, north was to the north so to speak. But about 800,000 years ago, once again, the North Pole points to the south, and there are a pile of lavas erupted over several tens of thousands of years, which preserve a reverse direction from at present. For a short time, the present direction was the current one. And then about 900,000 and a million years ago, the direction of the Earth's magnetic field preserved in the lavas is opposite to the present day. What we seem to be looking at there, in fact, is a similar pattern to that that we've seen on the ocean floor, except that it's vertical instead of horizontal. And that pattern in the volcano exists because of two facts. The fact that the Earth's magnetic field has reversed every now and again, and the fact also that when it reverses, when north, north becomes south, the direction of magnetization, the direction in which the little magnets in the magnetite point stays the same because that magnetite is at a lower temperature than its Curie point. Those two observations put together give us an explanation for the bands of um, reinforced and diminished magnetism over the floor of the the oceans. Let's go back to that diagram showing the dikes of the ocean floor. Remember that the dikes of the ocean floor split the ocean floor, rather like driving in a wedge, and that instead of a vertical pile of lavas recording the changes in the Earth's magnetic field as in the volcano, we have a symmetrical record on either side of the ridge, rather like a tape recorder. And where the magnetic field in the rocks points to the south, as in the black bands here, then clearly the rocks diminish the strength of the magnetic field that we observe 
when we take a magnet magnetometer over the ocean floor, where the record in the rocks points to the north and strengthens the magnetic field, then we get a band of reinforced magnetism. Confirmation of the, um, the picture of the ocean floor as spreading like a conveyor belt was obtained also from the age of the rocks of the ocean floor. The age of the rocks we can represent by the colored stripes of this diagram. The most recent rocks here in the dark red are clearly present day and have an age that we could call zero, if you like. As we move out from the center of the ocean toward the coasts, each of these bands represents rocks that are, uh, range in age of about 30 million years. So this would be a band of zero to 30, 30 to 60, 60 to 90, 90 to 120, 120 to 150, and finally the rocks closest to the uh, coast of Africa are about 180 million years old. These are very, very young rocks. The rocks that we know on the continents range in age up to, oh, well over three and a half thousand million years old, whereas these rocks of the oceans are about 180 million years old in the case of the Atlantic. And off the um, west coast of South America, for example, the age of the rocks of the ocean floor there is only about 40 million years. And the youth of the ocean rocks and the progressive increase in age of the ocean rocks towards the continents which border the oceans is confirmation of that picture of the oceans as conveyor belts spreading from the center. Now, that picture of the oceans as growing is in fact, if you don't look at it very carefully, a misleading one. The oceans certainly are spreading, spreading from the center. But in fact, they're not growing in area. It's the land of the Earth which is growing in area. Growing in area because the oceanic crust which is being created at the uh, spreading, spreading ridges is being reprocessed at the subduction zones. And that reprocessing, which produces island arcs of andesitic composition, leads to an increase in the area of land at the expense of the oceans. In fact, land is being created at the, a rate of about 50 acres per year by the reprocessing of oceanic crust. So we can look on the oceans not just as spreading conveyor belts, but as a kind of a factory, a factory that eventually leads to the production of land. And the oceans, far from growing, are in fact contracting, and that is the land which is growing in area. We can look at the, uh, the growth of the land by looking at the details of the volcanic processes which produce the island arcs from the oceanic crust. The question we must ask is, how can we melt basalt, basalt crust, and produce island arcs of a lighter rock more akin to granite. In order to understand the essence, the, the important part of the volcanic processes which recycle ocean lithosphere and make island arcs out of it, I'd like you to cast your mind back to the program on igneous rocks and remember what happened when igneous rocks solidified. You remember that the, the important point was that the minerals of the igneous rocks did not all form at once. The minerals formed in a certain order. And you could imagine that process taking place by thinking of the atoms moving in the liquid and gradually ordering themselves into minerals as the temperature dropped. Certain of the atoms seeking out the oxygen silicon tetrahedra and forming minerals at high temperatures, and other different atoms seeking out oxygen silicon tetrahedra at lower temperatures and forming different minerals. Now, I'd like you to try and retain the germ of that idea in your head.